girls, we are very privileged to have a man who has served in World War II, which we have been discussing and talked about, and I know you've been anxious to hear some of these uh, books from the library, and I want you to listen very closely, and he's going to give you a chance to answer questions after he is through telling you about his experiences. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Cobb. Double looking at me. I've been around a long time. But I'll tell you a little bit about my own experiences. I know you've been studying about World War II in general. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it's like for a young man to go in the Air Force and serve in Europe, bomb Germany, was shot down captured, and I spent most of the war in a German prison camp. But anyway, I was living in East Tennessee in a small town, just 18 years old when I joined the Air Force. And after about a year of training, they sent me to England. And I bombed Germany about, I think, nine times, and on my tenth mission, I was shot down. But now, here's the kind of plane that we flew back in World War II, not the jets you see today, these were old, slow, propeller-driven planes. And I brought it to show you the kind of a plane I was on when I was shot down. It's this one right here, it's called the B-24 Liberator. This was the B-17, that was the other <coughs> bomber we had over there. And these planes carried about a tenth of what the bombers carry today. These were myself <coughs> These were the fighter planes. That was a P-51, P-47, and a P-38. Now that's the main plane that we flew in, in Europe. But after being over in Europe for only about three months, I was in England. We made the first daylight bombing raid on Berlin, which, as you know, is the capital of Germany. And my plane was hit by any aircraft gun. And this big old tail you see back here was knocked off. So the plane wouldn't fly. So we had to bail out the parachutes. And there were 11 of us on the plane. And all 11 of us lived. So what I wanted to tell you was that when I bailed out, it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And believe it or not, I landed in an elementary school locker. <laughs> Just the school turned out. So all the kids came running out to where I was laying in this field. And the teachers got in a fight over which one was going to get my parachute because they didn't have any silk over there and they all wanted that parachute to make something out of. But just about the time I hit the ground, they were fighting over my parachute. This old man who was called a home guard came riding up on a bicycle in a uniform. He had a gun here and a gun here and a rifle over his shoulder. And he's the man that stuck a gun right between my eyes and captured me. And he was probably 75, 80 years old. He's probably older then than I am now. But anyway, I knew he'd shoot me if I didn't give up, so I didn't have much choice. So the first people I saw when I bailed out were kids about your age. And from there they took me to a, I guess it was the, what we call a mayor, Burgermeister's office. And I stayed there two or three hours, and they questioned me, and they finally locked me up in the basement of a beer distillery or brewery. I stayed there a few hours, the trucks came and hauled me off, took me to a big city in Brunswick, and locked me up in a city jail, and stayed there a couple of days. Then they put us on a train and sent us down to Frankfurt, Germany. And that's a big city. And there they sent us to an interrogation center called Dulag Luf. And in Germany, a Dulag is a prison. Luf just means air, so there's a prison for air. And there they put you in a room by yourself. They turn the lights off for a while, they turn them on for a while, they turn the heat up for a while, they turn the heat down for a while. And after two or three days of that, they'd bring you in and they'd question you and they'd ask you where you were from, what you were doing, what kind of plane you flew, how fast the plane would go, how many bombs would he carry. And uh, 
they'll tell you if you didn't tell them what they wanted to know, they'd shoot you. But they were just bluffing because our orders from our own government was you never tell anybody anything but your name, your rank, and your servant. So they bluffed everybody. Some of the boys talked, so I guess most of them did and I said. But anyway, that's where my prison days started, and that's where the rough times started. Up and then, not too bad. No food, but uh, not mistreated, really. But they put us on boxcars, and for five days, we went up into East Prussia, way up north, where in the wintertime it never gets daylight, and in the summertime it never gets dark. On that five-day trip, I think they fed us one meal, and there were about 40 people in a real small boxcar on the straw. Uh, they let us have water maybe once a day. Uh, that's it. Anyway, when we got up to the prison camp, that's what I brought you. I brought you a picture of that prison camp. You can have it. And then I'll tell you how it's like in being a fenced in a prison camp. Okay. Yeah, you can have one of these to take with you. But <clears throat> this is life in a prison camp. There's about I think six, eight thousand people in this camp. And this is just one little segment of it. It's surrounded by barbed wire. Every corner of that camp has a uh, tower on it. Machine guns and guards up there. And between the barbed wire and where you are, there's a little wire about that high. And that's called a warning wire. And anybody that touched that wire got shot. Quite a few of our people did get shot. Or if a ball rolled under it, you reached under it to get the ball to shoot you. Uh, this place uh, was, I've seen snow higher than the buildings. It was way up right on the Lithuanian border, and that's pretty far north, right on the Baltic Sea. But the main thing that was bad about those prison camps was a lack of food. Uh, you got no breakfast. For lunch, you got one cup of potato soup, and at night, oh, about four o'clock in the afternoon, you'd get about three little boiled potatoes about that big. And in addition to that, you got one slice of bread a day, and it was made out of or it was made out of sawdust. And your coffee, you got one cup of coffee a day, and it was made out of roasted acres. So you didn't get much to eat. Every once in a while, we'd get a Red Cross parcel from the International Red Cross. And it would have maybe a chocolate bar, a can of Solomon, a can of Spam, or something like that. It, and we'd have to divide that among about three or four people. But boredom was a big thing. You know, there really wasn't anything to do. You could just walk up in there, and we didn't have to work. Uh, the privates and the PFCs had to work. Sergeants and the officers did not have to work except keep their own barracks and their own cook. The meat that we got, well, once a week, we were supposed to get a little bit of meat in our potato soup. And the Germans were always telling us it was uh, meat from an ox. But they used to bring the meat into the camp and it was horse meat because the horse hind quarter still had the shoe on it. So you knew it wasn't. Uh, an oxen has a split to look at. Uh, of course, has a solid to it, but they tell us it was meat from an ox, but it was horse meat. And you got just about two or three ounces of meat a week. Had no heat in these buildings. As I said, it was snow and below zero. And you had one thin blanket. And you slept on triple decker bumps, just stacked up like that. And your mattress was made out like a burlap bag filled full of sawdust. And you had three little slats on you. That, that's all the hell's in your bed. Clothes, the only clothes I had were the clothes that I shot, was shot down. And eventually, I got a GI overcoat, straight to the overcoat. And we slept in it. That's the only way you can stay warm. I stayed in that camp from March until July. Then the Russians were coming in from their part of Europe, and they were getting close to that camp, so they evacuated us. They got us out of there. They put us 
was on an old rusty coal barge, and we spent three days across the North Sea. And there were so many of us on there, you couldn't sit down, you couldn't lie down, you had to stand up. No food and no water for three days. And we had three boys on the boat, and I guess you might say that they lost their pool and jumped overboard and were shot and left in the water. And then from there, we landed in a Swineland, which is a port city in northern Germany. And that was probably one of the roughest things of World War II. They called it a death march. There were about four or five thousand of us. And they put us on boxcars and took, took us to a new prison camp. And I have pictures of the march from the railroad station to that camp, and it's called a, one of the worst atrocities of World War II. They handcuffed us together. They turned police dogs on us. And they started to uh, stabbing everybody with the bayonets on the end of their guns. And nobody ever knew why they did it. They had no real reason to. And those of us that had a little food that we were carrying from the first camp to the second camp, they took that away from us. All of our belongings were lost on that march. And I brought you a picture of it that's been drawn. It's not an actual that that was really, really a, a bad time. And I stayed in that camp until through January. And at that time, the Russians were getting close to that camp, so they put us out on the road again, and we marched across Germany for 83 days. And uh, at night, we slept in barns if they were available. If they couldn't find barns, we slept out in the open field pastures. That's the coldest winter they've had in Germany in years. And one night I went to bed out on the ground, and when I woke up the next morning, my hair had frozen to the ground. Uh, almost nothing to eat on that except what the German soldiers could get the German farmers to give us, and that was primarily little boiled potatoes. You might not believe this, but I still like potatoes. And every once in a while, you get a turnip. I think I went a week one time, but all I had to eat was a turn about that big around, and I'd eat part of it every day. But that went on for 80 some odd days, all through the winter. I didn't have a bath in 83 days. I never had my shoes off in 83 days. I never had my hair cut in 83 days. And I was probably the filthiest human you ever saw. And you've heard of lice. I probably had the world record of 10 million lice. So when the Americans finally recaptured us right at the end of the war, the first thing they did was ran us through a delousing program, cut all of our hair off, burned their clothes, and gave us new clothes. But the worst part of the war for me, and of course when you get shot down like that, the first thing the Germans told me said, for you the war is over. Actually the war wasn't over. But you all have been studying about other battles and what happened in Europe, and I was in a prison camp, and all of that took Place. But Americans are very smart people, so we always knew what was going on because the prisoners had all, they had made a radio in every camp that I was in, they had taken wire and razor blades, they'd get a radio tube. Almost every day we got the news from the British Broadcasting Company, and they'd go around and they'd put the radio together and then they'd get the news and they'd tear it down send a part of it all over the camp but there wasn't any two parts of it close together. So Germans would tell us they were winning the war, but we would get the real news from England that they were losing the war and they had retreated or they had done this or that. So the Germans were always looking for that radio, but they never found it. As long as you were in a prison camp, generally the Germans did not mistreat you. They kind of left you alone as long as you didn't bother them fenced in and you were guarded. But when it got real bad was when you were out on the market. Then they kind of lost control of everything and they, they could be very cruel. And just briefly, I'm not going to tell you about what happened over in Japan and that part of the world, but I have a lot of friends who were prisoners over there who were captured in Corridor or the Pond. They had it much worse than that. The Germans, as I said, generally were not that cruel. Only when we were out on the road. The Japanese were pretty cool, I think, all the time. And now, 
Has anybody got any questions? I know you got. Now that was a civilian. I'm glad you brought that up. That's a misconception that a lot of people have. You read about concentration camps in Germany where they burned all the people. That was primarily political. Our Jewish people, our political prisoners, and Jewish people were the ones that they put in those camps, and they're the ones that were burned in the furnaces. Now there were a few Americans. There was a hundred and something American military people were in Buchenwald. But they did not stay there too long until they were taken out to Russian prison camp. But as far as I know, uh, no American soldier was cremated in one of those Those were civilians. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever get yeah, on that one trip that I'm talking about, everybody was uh, bitten by dogs, hit with rifle butts, stuffed with bayonets. Yeah, were all of us. And we were chained together where we couldn't really uh, walk or run. Anything to drink? Water and coffee made out of roasted eggs. What do you think would happen to you when you got Really and truly, I never thought I'd be captured. I always thought I'd either come home or get killed. But the Air Force did have a training program to tell you a little bit about what it was like in a prison camp so it didn't come completely, you know, unexpected. You had a general idea of what they did. Yeah. Why did they Why did they capture the Jews? Because Adolf Hitler thought that the German race was the very and the pure race, and he thought that the Jews, oh, would contaminate the race, and he also did not like the Jews because they controlled much of the money in the They were the bankers. Big businessman. They held a lot of wealth, and he wanted that. And the other thing was, he wanted a, a pure German race. Do you know how the people came back from the war? Well, in the old, in World War II, there were a little, I think, sixteen and a half million people served in the military. Uh, there was over around four hundred thousand killed, and there was. 100,000 wounded, and I believe there was about 150,000 prisoners all together. So they're right there. Mm -hmm. You said for the, 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 the bacon and bread of man, salt and salt. Mm -hmm. How do they get salt? Well, over, have you ever eaten pumpernickel bread, uh, German bread? It's a dark, heavy bread. And I guess they were short of grain. Everything was short in Germany. Everything went to the war effort food and everything. So what they did, they would take the grain that they normally made the bread out of and they would mix finely grain sawdust in it to make it go further. In fact, in 1944, they gave us a loaf of bread that was so molded it was green and on the bottom of it, it had stamped 1940. So the loaf of bread was four years old. But uh, once you broke it open, the inside of it, you could eat it. It tastes very good. I mean, what? Zooms. I didn't understand. Zooms. For Zooms. But in the Air Force, you didn't have them. I mean, like on on Oh, that would be interesting. And, and I really don't know your answer to that. The Air Force was set up in groups and squadrons. Yeah. So like a, the group I was in was a 448 bomb group, and it had four squadrons. Those four squadrons each had about 50 or 16 airplanes, so that, that's the way mine was set up. Mm -hmm. What job did you have on the plane? I was an engineer. And if I can see it on this plane, this picture I've got here, I'll show you where it was. I was an engineer, but in combat, I also had a gun turret. You can see this right up here at the very top of that airplane. That's where I sat. That's where I was sitting when I was shot down. Mm -hmm. uh, the crew on it was normally 10. You had a pilot, a co-pilot, a navigator, a bombardier, a radio operator, an engineer, and four gunners. The day I was shot down, there were 11 on it because our squadron commander was flying. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. What 
tech sergeant. Now, they don't have those anymore. I'm not sure what they're called today, but I, it's an E5 or an E6, something like that. I don't really know. Hmm? Was it called a dragon on the plane? On the plane? Not really, no. There was plenty of room on the plane. Hmm? On the plane? If we were going to be gone all day, the mess hall would usually fix us up a brown bag lunch, like a sandwich or something like that, or a piece of fruit. Mm -hmm. um, we all landed in within a few mile area. The plane, when I bailed out and opened my shoe, the German fighter tried to shoot me going down in my plane. He missed me, but we all landed, I'd say, within a five mile area, and then they collected us all after I spent some time in the basement of the brewery. That's where they put us all back together. Mm -hmm. Were there any women fighting in World War II? I'm glad you asked that. Not like there are today. Now, we had uh, wax and waves, but we did not have combat, women in combat. Uh, Desert Storm, Persian Gulf, to my knowledge, is the first time that women, other than nurses, have actually been in a combat area. Now, there were quite a few nurses captured in the Philippines in World War II. Do you ever have flashbacks? Oh, not really. Uh, I, I'm, war is bad. I, I can't leave anything else with you, but war is not good. But I was young. Uh, I came back from service, went to a couple of colleges, got my education. Got married, raised a family, went to work. And truthfully, I never thought too much about it until maybe mm -hmm. 10 years ago when I retired. I had more time to think about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What kind of bombs did you sell? Most of the time, they were 500 pound, just general bombs. And we also dropped uh, stick bombs of magnesium, which uh, burns everything up that it touches. How old were you in the Twenty-one. So by the time I was twenty-one years old, I had been in service, I had been shot down, I had been wounded, and been liberated by the time I was twenty-one years old. And if you don't believe it, I brought you a picture. <laughs> I know somebody's going to ask, why do young kids go, can you see that? Yeah. Now that's when I was eighteen years old. Now look at me today. <laughs> Have you heard the score on the Wisconsin game? You know, it's 
sounds strange to us, but uh, they went back to Germany and they served in the German army, yet they had lived over here for years. Uh, I'm sure they did, but not, not anybody that I know personally. Uh, I don't know that I ever knew anything that would have helped the Germans. They, they knew more about this airplane than I did, and I was the engineer, but uh, very little that they didn't know about me or that plane. They could tell you your name, where you were from, uh, what group you were with, what kind of plane you were from, how they did it, I don't know. They had good intelligence, but I don't think I knew anything about what they were doing for a while. How old am I now? 72. Same way I did. Uh, the pilot and I were the last crew. My job was to get everybody out of the plane from here back. He got everybody out of the front, and he and I went out right under here under the belly, right under there out of the long bay. Um, well, did you jump from the back? Jump from the bottom. Oh, See, this, this all opens up right in here. Door slide up like that, and there's a little walkway about that wide that went right down the middle of the plane. So you walked out on that and jumped right out. Well, the one I was in was going this way, but that, that would keep you jumping out. Now, if it was spinning that way, you might have a hard time getting out, but that was not it. I mean, would you get chopped up? Oh, no, you'll see you were jumping below the propellers. Uh, Here's where you get chopped up. <laughs> It blew up, and I was still up in my parachute. I saw it blow up, and the Germans went out and picked up pieces of it. The biggest thing I saw on it, they had a pile of that brewery with a piece of metal maybe about that long. Sure. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen to it. I didn't know whether my parachute would open. Everybody gets scared. Oh, nobody landed in the schoolyard but me. The rest of them landed around there, but I was the only one. I landed real close to the schoolhouse. In fact, I thought I was going to get him. Did they force you to fight? The American? No, I volunteered. No, no. They did some other nationalities, but not Americans or English or French. Now, there were some Polish, some Russians, and Austria, well, uh, they first probably had the army, but not Americans, uh, not to my knowledge. And I, toward the end of the war, and this is not in my field, but I just read a book about it. There's been a lot of things written about World War II. Now, toward the end of the war, the uh, Germans quit taking prisoners. If you study the, the Battle of the Bulge, the Bastogne, there were a hundred and something Americans captured there, but the Germans were marching off in the woods and shot them. And from that point on, I don't think the Germans took too many ground prisoners, and I don't think the Americans did too, because I think the Americans started shooting their own. Well, uh, I don't know. Back in those days, see, World War II was such a big war, almost everybody served. And what do you, you may not know this, but when you reached 18, they started to draft.
I'm not a hero. I'm a, I'm a victim of certain... No, <coughs> no prisoner of war is a hero. A prisoner of war is a victim of circumstances. Nobody wants to be one. Anybody else? He has another speaking engagement, so any more questions? I'll answer questions for another 10 minutes if you want to ask. Okay. Huh? How far was the trip? <laughs> From England to Berlin? I think it's about 500 miles. See, Europe, you can go over there from London to Paris like we would go to Dallas. The distances aren't great over there. And, and But these planes, I see the planes are made by seven, eight, nine hundred miles an hour. This old plane I was on, top speed when it was empty, was like 240 miles, and when you had those 6,000 pounds of bombs on there, it did about 150 miles an hour. So when you say 500 miles, up to 1,000 miles there and back, you're talking about about an eight-hour trip. Uh, it's unbelievable how fast the planes go today compared to what they did go back then. Dropped all of them at the same time. Dropped them on Berlin on the railroad yards. Now, if the, if the bombs are there, so right up here in the front of this thing, he had a, something he was looking through the bomb side. And he had a toggle switch. When he hit that switch, those bombs were supposed to fall out of the back. One time they didn't, and I had to go out there on this little walkway running through the belly of that thing, and I had to flip them out with a the screwdriver. There was a way you could do it. It had a emergency thing on it. No, I haven't. For three years in a row, my wife and I have been planning to go, and when it gets about time to make the reservations, I back out. I'm not sure I want to go back. But I will tell you this, last year, uh, the people who were in this prison camp up in Poland with me, uh, we raised the money, and I did get some money on that. We built a monument over there where that camp used to be, and quite a few of my friends went back over there when they dedicated it. The Polish government was real nice to them. They gave them the red carpet treatment. They had the band, the mayor, and uh, it was very nice, but I, there's nothing left. Oh, they brought back pictures, and where the camp was is a pine forest. There isn't any evidence that a you know, prison camp was ever there. That's right. Uh, they were shot down with a flying about 30,000. That's about the max of those planes to fly. They go a little higher than that. But it's not funny. I live right up the street here, about one block from the train. What? He left the street. What did you do before you got into the war? I was going to school. I worked a while, just a few months in a shipyard after I got out of high school, and then I fell in the airport. Wouldn't you run out of fuel going to Berlin? <coughs> well, I didn't hear your question. Wouldn't you run out of fuel going to Berlin and back? No, we could do that. That was about the extent. That's about as far as we could go. Well, that would be what, what, what? Oh, I don't have any idea. I never saw it after that. They called me away on the truck, and I never saw
you know, it landed out in an open field and exploded. As soon as it hit the ground, it just went up in flames and exploded. Were any kind of nuclear, any kind of animal cut from the ground? Oh, no, no. The atomic bomb wasn't developed until 1945. They tested it in the summer of 45, dropped it in Albany, I think, uh, maybe off the mustard tin. That's close. I could have got good up in Tennessee, and that's where the bomb was developed at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, up about 30 miles outside of Mossville. Um, when you drop a bomb, or they like Oh, I'm sure it did. Uh, the Americans never tried to kill civilians. They always tried to hit a target, like a, a manufacturing plant, a warehouse, railroads. But when you're up at 30,000 feet, and as I said, back then the equipment was not what it is today, it wasn't that accurate. So uh, you never were sure where your bombs hit. You might be wanting to hit a railroad, you might hit a school or a hospital. It's just, it's... I'm sure we killed many thousands of students. Have you ever seen the police? Have a what? Have you ever seen the police? Oh, yeah. Not in many, many. When I fly now, I fly American Airlines. <laughs> but back then, yes, I flew on this flight. Can you bomb come over the What? No. I have seen bombs dropped on other planes. Uh, if you've seen some of these movies, and they take actual photos and work them into a movie. Like one plane would be up here, and another plane would be down here. This one would drop these bombs, and I've seen them hit this plane down here, and go this way. So we killed a lot of our own people that way, just through mistakes. Here's the good. Yeah. Do I have a girlfriend? Oh, I may have, but that's not the one I married. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, the plane that you flew, did it have, uh, like, was there anything on it? Did you, like, paint anything on it? Yeah, when I was flying, they were painted khaki colors. Mm -hmm. Uh, boy, back there was the next boy next to you there that's got the army thing on. It was somewhat like that, and, uh, then later on in the war, after I was shot down, they quit painting them. They left them silver. But uh, when I was flying, they were all camouflage. What they call camouflage. Yeah. Did you see them? Yeah, it had pictures on it, numbers. They had uh, a lot of men and girls on it. Yeah. Uh, his question was, when I was in prison, did anybody die from my food? We had quite a few to die. I'm not certain that uh, they died from my food because if they got sick, uh, they really didn't have anything to treat them. We had an American doctor, but he had been shot. He was a flat surgeon. He'd been shot down, but he had no medicine, and the Germans gave him very, very little medicine. The Red Cross got a little in there, but if he took pneumonia or some other disease, they had very little treatment. So yes, we had them to die. I'm not sure that lack of food was the primary cause, but it probably was a contributing thing because you were in a weakened condition, so any disease you <coughs> got was probably uh, worse than good. Day. We had quite a few shot by the Germans, as I told you earlier, uh, just not really trying to escape, but they just uh, did something wrong and German shot them. So we had a little cemetery out the side of the prison campus, and, uh, after the war, they took them up and brought them back. My name is Clark L. Cockle, C-O-C-K-R-E-W-L.
Army Air Corps. So I'm assuming they did everything. We wore, we wore Army uniforms. See, today they wear the blue uniform of the Air Force. Back then, I wore the same kind of a uniform that the uh, infantry did. Oh, yeah, we had always had... Uh, in fact, I shot down a German plane one time. Well, the uh, fighter planes were always trying to shoot us down when we were going over there to bomb the country. No, you don't dog fight with these big planes. Uh, they, they won't do it. Now, these could. Yeah, these could. These are the ones. In fact, when we made a mission, most of the time, we had some of these planes with us to fight the German planes off so we could get through. Somebody else in the middle has to go. Okay. Um, how did you get back to America from the prison? Well, when we were, they, the Germans turned us over to the Americans when they saw, oh, it's right at the end of the war, it's the 26th day of April, 1945. Okay. And they moved us into a German air base that we had, the Americans had captured. And we stayed there a few days, and uh, as I said, they killed the lice on us and got us a bath, got our head shaved, gave us new clothes. We couldn't eat. That's something else I need to tell you. When you go without food for a year or two, and then you get food, you can't eat it. You have to, they put all of us on a diet. You could only have certain foods and uh, no seconds, uh, no bread. And they had uh, big canvas bags stuck around with something like eggnog in it. It was milk and eggs and sugar, I guess. We could drink that. But uh, once you've gone without food for a long time, it takes you several months to get your uh, back in shape. Did you ever need a for a No. They don't give medals to kill you. Unless you kill them, you know, protecting somebody or something like that. Did you Oh, I said I shot it. I'm sure I did, but I know I shot down a German No, not on the ground. I know the only gun I ever had except in the plane I had a 45 pistol. Uh, yeah. This one right here? Now that says I'm a lifetime member of the American ex prisoners of War. It's an organization. Okay, I've enjoyed it. Uh, you got a question? Yeah. Yeah. It happens occasionally. War is a peculiar thing. People don't act like they normally act when a war is going on. They, they the pressures are great. But, uh, I'm not justifying what the Germans or the Japanese do, but toward the end of the war, the German transportation system broke down. They themselves had trouble getting enough food. Not the farmers, but the city. They had no way to get the food into the cities. And I'm not sure everything they did was on purpose. I think sometimes they were forced into things. Mm -hmm. No, I never did. I was in there about uh, a year or a year and three months. I've enjoyed it. And your teacher has these things that she'll pass out to you. And this is the this is one of the actual camps that I was in, and uh, you'll see how they lined us up to count us every day, twice a day. And those barracks had about twice as many people in them as they were built to have. And uh, it was, that's the only thing we saw right there. And then the other one, if you remember, I told you about the march where they had the dogs and the guns and all that. If you have a picture of that, you can keep those. Okay, thank you.
Yeah. Okay. You want to talk a little bit about the plane that uh, you... Uh, well, the one I flew in is the second one from the top. It's a B-24 Liberator. The other planes are the main planes that flew in World War II. They were the, the three best fighters that we had and the two best bombers. These are the only two heavy bombers, the B-17 at the bottom, B-24 next close to the top, P-51, the P-50, P-47, and the P-39. That's the main fighter planes and bombers that we had. We had some medium bombers because we only two big ones. Can you explain your sketches? Okay. I hope this. Can you explain those pieces so they can pick them up? Okay, now. <clears throat> Let me show you what this is here on the prison. This is just one part of it. There was three parts, just like this. You know, I told you there was barbed wire all the way around it. All right, here's your barbed wire. These are big, tall fences covered with barbed wire. Here's your fire towers on each end of them where the guards sat, and they had machine guns and rifles. Now, this is the little line that I told you they called the warning line. If you as much as touch that, they shoot you. And oh, see over here on this side, there's another string of barbed wire, and the Germans walked between these two rows of barbed wire, and there would be another part of the camp over here. Now, this is where we lived. There was four rooms, and they were just packed solid, and I said it got so cold sometimes the snow got right up to the top of the thing there. You know, 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 you now, here is a picture of that march that I told you where they had the dogs on it. You see the dogs? The guys are all handcuffed together. And this is Captain Walter Picard. He's called the Butcher of Berlin. And these are the prisoners coming down the road here. These are the guards. Are you in that picture? No, I mean, this is just a, it's a drawing. It's not an actual picture, but I was on this particular march. And it happened on July the 18th of 19th. I didn't. Oh, yeah, somebody drew that. And somebody drew this. Uh, there are no pictures. Actual pictures of these camps. That's a regular machine gun. Yeah, the same. Yeah, the same.